entertained. Good morning, uh, I'm Vicki Bissinger and I teach in nursing, the obstetrics uh, class and simulation and in clinical. And this morning I was going to share the games that uh, the students love to play. I had attended one of the um, classes that we had here on campus and it stuck out to me that uh, some of the instructors were trying to figure out how to get the students involved with each other and work on things together and get excited about the class. So I um, discussed games and we do a lot of games. Even the students that are not familiar with each other at all love to play the games. They get really competitive and they get excited. And then, of course, when you're recalling that information, then they um, have a better recall on that. And I'll, I have pulled up, can I share screen on here? I have uh, pulled up just one of my Jeopardy games. I do Jeopardy, who wants to be a millionaire, Pictionary, um, several others. But the Jeopardy one to me is the most fun because they get to do groups. I have the buzzers. I'm still, okay, screen save. Here we go. Okay, can, can you see it? Yes, no. Yes, we can. Okay, okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right, um, and you can download this from the internet. It's, if you notice, it's actually, it has a T instead of a D. So that's why it's not copywritten. So uh, let's do this. Now I'm not super tech, so I don't have the music uh, coordinated with it, but if you start, it does have the instructions um, it talks, obviously, if you look across the top, I, I do teach women's health, uh, and they, they just choose the, uh, whatever number they want. Uh, I hand out poker chips to coordinate with 600, 800, 1,000, and then when we get to the end of the game, uh, whoever has the most money wins prizes. So it works really well. It, it is a little time consuming in class, but as you see, there are a lot of uh, different subjects, different options for questions. Uh, a lot of times they even talk amongst themselves, intra-team, not just within the team, and they get excited about it and they kind of throw things out there and we'll talk about why it wouldn't be that or it wouldn't be that answer or make them critically think and ask um, why wouldn't it be that answer? And I even have the, um, like I said, who wants to be a millionaire? And the Jeopardy, I have a whiteboard and they have to write um, what is. And they, they do not like that because they want to say it right then and right there, <laughs> but uh, they really do like it. And uh, I think it adds a lot to content that um, you may not be able to get across to them if you're just lecturing and uh, talking. We uh, love to play Pictionary, as I mentioned, uh, because some of their pictures are really interesting and they get it right away and uh, the games are just really nice. I like to do them, especially maybe uh, the week before an exam. Uh, and it helps them to grasp the material when they're reviewing their notes and their and their book or the important points that we've hit. Uh, that's pretty much, unless you want to play, <laughs> you can answer the questions and I can, I can uh, tell you if you're right or, uh, but I've had a lot of luck and a lot of fun playing the the different games with the students. And they have a lot of fun. They always comment, oh, I like that. Can't we do that every week? If I could have a six hour class, we could do that every week. <laughs> so. It looks great. It looks great. Uh, Jessica? 
think you might have said this, but what do you give, what are some prize ideas that you that that's a really good question. Uh, when the idea of a game was presented to me several years ago, uh, that was my thought. I'm like, these are adults. Do they really want to play games? And what kind of, of things would you give them? And we've done different things. Uh, one of my associates here, she gives crazy pins, uh, little slinky type toys or whatever, uh, I tend to give candy <laughs> or healthy food. Uh, I have books uh, that I buy through Amazon. Uh, today is a great day. Just a little notebook, uh, a little small one, and they can choose whatever titles on the front of their little book. I give um, different school supply type things that they would use or nursing things. Uh, we have cards that they can use to study. You can buy in a um, pack of cards. It covers all kinds of subjects and I'll hand out those cards, even uh, med search, medical surgical subjects and not just obstetrics. But um, I was surprised at what they liked, but th they really do think it's cool, but they won, <laughs> they won something and they get a lot out of it. And they can use the cards for uh, studying. So. Nice. Oh, thank you. That's that. Um, all right, Mayan. Let me. I was trying to release the screen here. <laughs> there you go. It went away, right? <laughs> Hi, guys. Good morning. How are Hi. you? Good. I am so happy to be here. Sorry for joining in late. I had technical issues, of course. Um, <laughs> And I would like to share some of the activities that I do in class um, that my students really like and are very engaged. Um, I don't know how many of you participated in my last uh, um, session. I shared how I do a podcast series with my students uh, in Comp 2. So we're not only writing papers, we're also recording our own podcast episodes and we're learning how it is how do we write differently for the year so not only for an audience who reads your stories but also for someone who just listens to you um, they love it and I even have a student, a student a former student of mine that used the tools that we learned in class to start her own podcast and she's making money I was like yes um, she sent me out that she got her first check. So that was, that was exciting. Um, and in order to engage the students in like the hype of podcasts, cause it's very foreign to a lot of my students. Some of them never even listened to podcasts before. Um, so what I do first, we have this very tedious and long and somewhat boring class about Audacity, which is the software that we use to create the podcast, to record and edit and add music to. Um, so we learn how to split and how to cut and how to add music and import and export and all the technicalities. Um, and then after that very what I call sad class, <laughs> um, I have to get them hyped. I have to like do something that they will really enjoy doing. So I dedicate the next session to an interview assignment. Um, I'm going to share that uh, assignment with you just so that you, you get an idea of what it is that we're doing. Uh, 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 how do I do that? Uh, let me, sorry. Yes, it's right here. I'm going to share my screen. My computer doesn't like me today. I don't know why. It's always the days we're presenting, right? That our computers don't like us. <laughs> yes, and I don't know what's going on. Oh, I know why. Okay, because something is bothering it. Okay, now I can do it. Sometimes one thing completely destroys everything for you. So, okay, yes. Share this share. Can you see it now?
Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so this is something that they, um, they do in class. So in preparation for the podcast uh, uh, project, um, the goal is to have somewhat uh, shared experience that gets the students to feel more comfortable with one another. Um, they, each of them, I pair them up and each of them has to be the interviewer and the interviewee. Um, as they are interviewing, they have to um, learn what kind of questions they need to ask, how to get their friends to um, share the story. The assignment is to have a friend share um, either an experience in which they felt out of place or when they felt in their element, basically. Um, which it doesn't have to be, you know, the biggest experience of their lives. It can be how um, I always uh, provide my own example. Um, we had a big important party that we went to. And of course, on the way to the party, uh, when I'm all dressed up in a you know, evening dress and high heels, um, I realized that we forgot my baby's bottle at home. So I had to go into Kroger very fancy to buy baby formula. Um, and that is the moment that I felt completely out of place. Everyone looked at me weird. It was like, okay, let's get this and get out as fast as I can. And everyone laughed and, you know, and that is pretty much what I want them to share. It doesn't have to be their greatest moment or their most scary moment of life. Um, and that's pretty much the assignment. And as they do that, they, I, I give them the first 30 minutes of class to do that um, somewhere on campus and then come back to class. Um, why do I do that? I allow them to go to a, a quiet place and actually record because the recording has to be very quiet and very clean. And then they come back to share and they love it. Um, they are making new connections. They learn about their friends. They um, always talk about the, the amount of time it takes to actually record and how they hate listening to themselves. Um, and then they get to edit it together. And the next class will play it out. We play all of the recordings and people start adding music or adding or su having suggestions. Maybe you should take this part out. Maybe you should add this. An intro would have been great. We're doing this together. It's very shared experience. Um, I can play some of previous classes recordings um, if you want to listen to how it sounds eventually. Um, but that is something that my students really like and actually look forward to. It gets project three to be this wow experience and not just, huh, okay, yeah, fine, I'll do it, you know, yeah. Sounds like a very cool assignment. I would think it was fun if I was your student, for sure. If you want to listen to some, I have some ready. If not, that's okay, too. I don't want to take anyone's time. I was going to say, I think you've got a minute or two, so if you want to share, absolutely. If you don't, it's, that's totally up to you. Sure, yeah, let me play it out. Okay. Um, I don't even have to share my screen because it's just the voice. So that's great. Uh, all right. So this is a final version of one student. Let me know if you hear it. That's a good one. Not hearing anything yet. No? Wait. No. Let me see this. No, I guess we won't listen to it. Sorry. Well, if you figure out how to make it so we can hear, and maybe at the end when everybody's gone, if we have time, we'd love to hear it. How about that? Absolutely. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Mary Elizabeth, will you share with us, please? It's good to see you. I haven't seen you in forever. You're muted, Fran. I just undid it. All right. So Neely Ann and Amy know that I terribly over-prepare all the time. So um, I am going to hop into a piece of a PowerPoint that I had done before, and we'll sort of roll forward to the end of it. So I'm going to share my screen. Let's see here. 
Okay, so the piece that I'll pick up on is, and I need to preface this by saying that I lean very heavily on technology. The group of students that I'm going to talk about are English as a second language students. We offer levels two, three, and four, which is high beginner, low intermediate, high intermediate. And Kathy and I created an ESL version of reading support. So back down at the high beginner, low intermediate, high intermediate, I build into reading support. So at the low, this is the low intermediate group, the reading three group. And like I said, I lean heavily on tech. So for all the classes, even though this is a grammar three class in their first week of classes, they do an individual module where they learn all of the tech in D2L. Um, so then moving forward to the example that I want to talk about, um, in every class we do um, pieces like think, pair, share, which is shoulder buddies when they're working with partners, uh, they get a topic, they turn to their partner, they discuss it, they share out to the large group. We do numbered heads together where you count off in groups of three or four. They move across the classroom to other groups. They change the configuration through the semester. One of the things they have to do is learn the names of every single student in the class. And if by the end of the semester, they've learned the name of every single student in the class, they get a couple of points of extra credit on the final exam because for ESL students, that becomes their cohort out on the Southeast campus throughout their entire post um, content college career. Um, we do jigsaws, which is where you divide them into groups. They become experts on a piece of a particular topic. Then you mix them up and they explain that topic to other groups. And so this is an example of that. In reading three, one of the biggest problems that ESL students have is the lack of vocabulary. Native English speakers go into their content classes with about 18,000 academic words. ESL students go in with about 4,000. So there's a huge vocabulary gap. So one of the things we do is they ask me all the time, what is the best dictionary to use? So I've created, a, it's a two class assignment. We look at four paper dictionaries and three online, since everybody does online dictionaries. We start with a document like this. They have, we're using the same word, poison. This is the online piece. They have four columns. We're looking at a dictionary for native speakers and a dictionary for ESL students. For the paper dictionary version, we have a Merriam-Webster, which is for native speakers and the Merriam-Webster for ESL, the Oxford for native speakers, the Oxford for ESL. We model what they're doing by filling out these questions as a full class. They get into numbered head together groups, which is in small groups to fill out the ESL version. Then they go home and finish it. And then they come back, report out as a group. And then we do a jigsaw version where they get into groups of three or four students. They fill out this form. And then they, if you have four students, they are separated again so that each, let's say a group of four, they're numbered one, two, three, four. Each one of the ones becomes the expert for another group just on this category. And another group becomes the expert just on this one, becomes the expert just on this one. And they explain the content on this one to the rest of the group. So each student becomes a content expert on each of these dictionaries. And then at the end, there's a question at the bottom that says, how easy is this dictionary for you to read? As a group, they decide which dictionaries were best for them. We do a report out to the full class where we make, um, we poll which dictionaries were the easiest. And then we discuss how will this impact them as they go into their content courses. So that by the end of the exercise, everyone has come up with a dictionary they think they would prefer as a paper dictionary and an online dictionary that they think they would prefer. And we do some critical thinking exercises on how they are going to use these dictionaries in their content classes after ESL going forward. 
done this four different years and every single student is totally invested in the exercise because they see the application beyond the ESL program into all of their majors, including mathematics, because it impacts all of them. So even though this is a two class session assignment, everyone understands its connection. And this is one of the most highly rated assignments I do every time I teach this course. So there you go. Great, thank you. It's so nice when you know the students are getting value out of it, right? <laughs> Um, that's awesome. Thank you. All right, Miss Kathy. All right. Um, I am going to share my screen here mostly to keep me on track. <laughs> um, so one of the biggest issues I teach learning support reading, by the way, um, and one of my biggest issues, and I think many of us can probably relate is sometimes students get very passive in class and we want to make them more active learners. So I try to do a lot of things to engage. You know, that's usually my mission, um, engage them in the thinking that's supposed to be going on. And I, I've always been a proponent of games and hands-on activities, and I'm going to show you a few of those. Um, I've recently leaned into pre-learning activities. Um, instead of only doing games like for review um, or hands-on activities and stations for review at the end of a module, I'm starting to apply them more at the beginning as a way to activate. I've, I've just seen it work to get students more focused on the topic they're about to learn. It also lets them realize that they don't already know this. Some of my topics, I teach learning support reading, they sound basic, right? For example, we just learned facts versus opinions. They already think they know what a fact is. Um, so we do a Kahoot on facts and opinions. They see very quickly, they don't know what facts are yet. So um, then their brain, schemas activated when I go into teaching it they recognize oh that's why I got that one wrong because I didn't realize that just because it says it's a fact doesn't make it a fact and necessarily a fact doesn't have to be you don't have to it doesn't have to be true it may turn out to be not true um so pre-activities I'm getting to be I don't know a big fan of so here's some of my examples um a kahoot any kind of game that's kind of quick, it lets them take a little inventory. And um, I'm sure you've seen the research that pre-tests, pre-quizzing is a really helpful technique for students to learn. Um, it activates that background knowledge. Another thing I do is I hand out different articles, well, maybe the same article to students, and I have them highlight, give, give everybody highlighters and have them find the facts and opinions. And again, I do this before I would teach that, for example, or I could have, have them highlight words that are meant to persuade, um, words that have a feeling in them. And so, and then they compare with the people next to them, what words did you highlight? and why, we, then we can talk about it as a whole group. And it really leads into these different topics that I then teach that they may not have been invested in had they not just seen the application in something they were reading. Um, another activity that I like to do to kind of activate is I, we have um, magazines or reading material in class and I'll have them sort, um, cut things out in that, that fit into those different categories. So if something's meant to persuade, they have to put it in this folder. Entertain, they would put it in another folder and inform. Um, and then if there's articles they're not sure of, then they put it into this other folder with a big question mark. And then the ones in the question mark, we can talk about as a whole class. The, that, those are usually the trickier ones. Um, and I have people then check the folders, you know, did you, what ones, belonged or didn't belong. And we kind of talk about why it's important to recognize when someone is trying to persuade us and how that can sometimes feel like information um, and why it's important to be aware when it's not strictly information. So those are just a couple of the pre-learning activities. And I've really had um, good results from those with students being more engaged than when I do take 10 minutes to 
maybe lecture on a topic. I try to do this first. Um, and then there's other hands-on uh, things that I do. Um, so I like to have students physically manipulate things. I think that makes greater connections in the brain rather than just reading and learning or hearing about it. So I, and again, when I say it out loud, I know it sounds like maybe elementary school, but my students have asked for more of this. So um, one of the things I do is I make sentence strips. So, and I, and I give them like in a mystery folder to everybody. And I basically, you have a puzzle in front of you. The first person or team to solve it, you know, um, gets whatever, extra credit or gets to be done and move on to the next task. So, and then there'll be different colors usually mixed up in the, in the folder. Um, each color they'll, I have them do this in small groups and they soon realize that the topic on the pink is related. Like, so this must turn into a paragraph. And then the topic on the orange papers relate. So this must turn into a paragraph, et cetera. And then they realize they're using the transitions that we've been learning about in class to create um, the structure of a solid paragraph. So that's just kind of one example. So you can make sentence, I call them sentence strips. Sometimes they're not sentences, but have students sort things into whatever category that you put out there, um, put things in a hierarchical order order or a time order um, or matching. I have another set of envelopes that I use for that matching. They're over here. Um, so for this one, I have the names of different ways that writers organized their thoughts. So comparing, contrasting, cause and effect. And then students match that with the definition of those patterns. Um, so this one says, presents the explanation of a meaning of a word, an example of how it's used in context. So they would match what's that pattern called with the definition, and then they further have to match it with example words or transitions that are gonna be found in that pattern. So, and I don't tell them what to do. They just get this mystery envelope and they have to figure out for themselves that they're even supposed to match. So I, I love to hear the conversations in the groups, you know, people figuring it, this out together because that's, you know, half of the work there is to just even know what to do. Um, so, the, and the reason for this is the more multimodal we can make things, the more connections that will be made for students. And it gives students an opportunity to teach each other and learn from each other in a non-threatening kind of way. Um, everybody can add something to solving the puzzles. Um, and it just, it adds um, another layer of interaction to the class. Again, I just sit back and walk around and, you know, they'll ask me for a check. Like, I think we solved it and I'll go and check. And I'm like, oh, not quite. And then they got to figure out their mistakes. Um, so those are my samples. Does anybody have any questions on any of those? Well, I guess we should ask them at the end, but um, so sometimes I do this in stations around the room. So students will come into the room and there'll be signs up like these and they, you know, kind of go and quickly sit maybe with a friend. So at least they'll know somebody and there'll be these different tasks and then we'll rotate. Um, yeah. So I like to, but I, I have found these kinds of hands-on things work really well at the way beginning and at the way end of the learning process. That's my favorite time to do them. And then I'm kind of the boring middle piece. <laughs> uh, we know you're not boring. We know that. So thank you for sharing. Um, all right, Mona. I love all of these ideas. Um, and a lot of them I've, I use as well. Um, I think the, the thing with sociology is that we are so 
thought heavy, not that other disciplines don't think, but we have a lot of theoretical perspectives and a lot of concepts. And I have students write about them all the time. But when we, when I started this, it was probably, I don't know, maybe five years ago, I was trying to figure out how to get students to kind of match the concepts that go along with the perspectives or the, the approaches. So I'm going to show you my screen. Um, hopefully I can do this. Um, this is one of the activities that I have them do in class. I divide them into groups. We have seven social institutions. Education is one of them. Uh, medicine's another, et cetera, et cetera. And so I've got seven groups. And they have to use the concepts to draw pictures of that social institution according to the three different approaches. So this one is about medicine. All right, I, I believe so, yep. Um, so first, symbolic interaction. They think about, you know, what does, how, how do we determine, you know, what are the meanings and values we place on being healthy or being sick? And then, of course, social conflict is all about, you know, money and inequality. And then structural functionalism, is is all about you know those different roles and those different statuses that go along with you know how to become healthy what is the patient what is what is the doctor's role all of these these different types of things and they seem to really like it so if you've ever been in a classroom after me um yeah there are huge posters all over the room um, with their different pictures. Um, we also do it for deviance because deviance has many different theories that go along with explaining that. Um, was another thing, oh, I know what I was gonna show you. We also talk a lot about research. And so one of the things that I created early on um, were these of, were these worksheets. And instead of passing them out, I just decided to put them in my PowerPoint. So I divide them into groups and in the group, they have to like read the, read the sentence and then decide what the independent variable is and what the dependent variable is. And sometimes it becomes kind of an interesting thing to listen to how they decide what is what, all right? Um, can I share one more thing? All right. The other thing that I've just started is I've asked students to, you know, write down their questions at the beginning of a topic and, you know, give me one preconceived idea that you have about this topic, write one question that you, you're interested in, things that you want to learn more about, and then, um, the last one is how will you decide what is legitimate information and what's illegitimate information given all the, the, the social media. So we have, we started this like two weeks ago and we're, we're still on the topic of, of race and ethnicity and gender and sex and sexuality. So we'll be wrapping it up on Monday and Tuesday of next week but some of the preconceived ideas that they have are really interesting. <laughs> so um, I've gathered all of their questions and, and we'll be sorting through those. I've got them divided into groups. The groups are gonna come back and kind of, you know, share what they thought and what they've discovered through reading the textbook and, and talking through the, the PowerPoints. It sounds really, all over the place, but I'm working on it because that's my new thing. And we have, that's how we start new things, right? Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Philip, one more Philip will share. And then if we've got time for questions, we'll take questions. Okay. Um, well, when I was asked to be on the panel, I started thinking about, um, small items that I've implemented um, in my class based on a Q training. And uh, I, I've long um, had an aversion to doing um, 
surveys in class, uh, but um, there was a there was a little um, section on this mid semester survey that you could do uh, called uh, Start Stop Continue, uh, and I thought, well, that that sounds very very simple. So I thought I'm going to try this, and so uh, I I tried this uh, in my class, and I thought I would uh, talk just a bit about the results and um, my takeaways from my little experiment with start, stop, continue. Uh, it's very simple. I love the simplicity. You ask your students uh, three questions, which I did in uh, four sections this semester. Uh, what should I start doing? Uh, please let me know how I can better serve your needs as an instructor. What should I stop doing? Uh, please let me know what I should stop doing as your instructor. I was a little intimidated about uh, giving them that question, but, uh, and number three, what should I continue doing? Please let me know um, what I should uh, continue doing as your instructor. Um, so uh, I thought some of the replies were very revealing to me, actually. Um, some students uh, I thought did a great job of constructively opening themselves up to me. Um, I list this one first because I think it's so true and I just had not thought about it. Uh, a, two, two different students said that I cut students' quest, uh, questions off when they asked them. I'm, I'm very brief in and they were very gentle in telling me this. You, you do this unintentionally. I know you're in a rush to cover material. Uh, and, and that was enough to make the survey uh, worth it. I'm like, and I showed this uh, to my class. I said, you're right. Uh, I do feel in a hurry often. Uh, I teach accounting. Uh, we accounting teachers say, all right, we've got certain material that has to be covered. You know, I'm plowing through. And uh, I think, I, I think, yes, that's me. And so I committed to them uh, to um, paying more attention to their questions and trying not to seem like I'm in such a hurry, uh, even though I really am. Um, a couple of other things that um, students asked me to stop doing, um, proctoring exams. Um, so I'm not going to quit proctoring exams because I think um, that's a, a integrity a exam integrity issue. But we had a discussion about um, the merits of proctoring exams. Uh, and um, so we had an open discussion about it. Uh, another student asked that I um, stop using um, the, the videos um, provided by the textbook. They were boring. Um, and uh, I can agree with that somewhat. Um, and what I, my takeaway from that is um, I do try to shorten the videos. That is, if there are topics, I can, the videos are in bytes and I can remove bytes of topics. And I, I committed to going back through those videos again myself and seeing if there were topics that were um, less important uh, that I could remove. Um, so anyway, those are some of the things students asked me to stop doing. Uh, uh, asked things students asked me to start doing um, extend exam time. Um, prior to COVID, uh, I always gave exams in class. They were paper exams, and we had a natural time limit, the time of the class period, which is an hour and 25 minutes, or you could say 90 minutes. Um, and post COVID, um, we went to giving exams. During COVID, we went to giving exams online and we've continued that. So that continues. So my exams are now online. And but the students sort of opened my eyes to the fact that 
I don't, I'm not contained by the class when it comes to the exam now because our exams are not contained in the 85 minute class period. And so um, I have agreed to extend the time some. Um, I do have many ESL students um, at, the, at the Southeast campus and they especially struggle with time. And, and I'm like, okay, I'm not bound by the class time uh, since the exams uh, are online now. Um, they ask for other things, uh, uh, previews of chapters, uh, ask them to ask questions more. Um, things you might expect, uh, clear study guides. I do have a study guide, um, uh, improved labeling in, in D2L. Um, I think students are confused. There are many topics in each module and students want to know which ones are graded, which ones count for the grade. And so, so their frustration is you've got all these teaching assignments, uh, which, you know, just tell me which ones I have to do for my grade, I think is what came from that. Um, label journal paper. So I teach accounting. I hand out paper uh, ledgers in class so we can do problems by hand. Uh, they like that, but it's just general journal paper. They want it, they want it labeled by exercise and page number for their assistance. And I started doing that. So uh, uh, that was another takeaway. Um, items to continue. Um, we work plenty of problems in class um, and they find that very helpful. I put them in groups. I tell them, you know, they're each an accounting firm. Uh, and I, I leave, I leave the room sometimes because I don't want them to depend on me. I want them to figure, I want them to depend on each other. Um, they like that. They like that we have plenty of examples in contrast, uh, to students thinking I'm in a hurry. One student said they loved the slow pace of my class. They thought that was helpful. So very conflicting information there. Um, students like that we work on paper sometimes. Everything is not digital, right? So their homework is digital. Um, they like that. They like the uh, flexibility of the online homework. I have some flexibility with dates and they really do dates and they really appreciate that. Um, they like taking their exams at home. Um, just some thoughts about um, giving this survey. Um, um, students and I probably connected more in a real way on the date that we went over the results of this survey than we had in any other class period um, this semester. Um, so it was, a, it was a real exchange and I tried to be open uh, to their thoughts. And uh, anyway, I did make some changes, but limit uh, you know, they weren't dramatic changes. It didn't take that much for me to label journal or it is going to be a commitment to go back through the um, online videos that they have to watch and see what I can cut out. But I've committed to doing that. Uh, so, um, you know, mid-semester survey doesn't have to result in dramatic changes. Maybe there's something that... Uh, I don't see that students see, like me being in a hurry, me appearing and probably actually cutting students off in terms of answering their questions. So that was revealing. Um, find the sweet spot for the survey, so don't give it too soon. Um, it right now may be a little bit late to give it this semester, but maybe in a future semester, um, make it anonymous as you can. I think some students were hesitant to reply simply because they weren't sure it would be anonymous. Um, yeah, uh, so create, uh, try to create a couple of small wins from your mid-semester survey and you don't have to uh, redo your entire course, just slight mid-course adjustments. And I think that uh, the start, stop, continue, uh, 
worked very well for me as a mid-semester survey. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, um, let's let's see if I can unshare this. Uh, uh, amazing to be able to share with your students and show your willingness to learn from their feedback. I think that's so cool. Um, I think that's so valuable that we show our students that. So we've got a few minutes, you all, not a ton, but um, what questions do you have or any final thoughts, things you want to share? I had a question about the, um, I guess, Vicki, the Jeopardy. Uh, do, you know, in Jeopardy, it's like the first person who presses the button gets the gets to answer. I mean, how do you handle that in class? I have buttons. Ah, they, okay. make, they make different noises. I actually <laughs> purchased them online. Uh, one sounds like a fire engine and one sounds like a... Um, horn blowing and they're they think that's funny too <laughs> but i actually use buttons do you, do you make them um answer in the form of a question yeah that's what I, I had they don't like that but i had the little whiteboards where they had to put you know the what is and then answer i do <laughs> and they can't write fast enough they think they have to say it right now <laughs> So you're also teaching patience, right? Yes, that, that's true. A bonus skill. Yes. I got a really good question I'm for Vicki. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay, Marla and uh, Carson. Uh -huh. Did you make the, are you making the Jeopardy through PowerPoint? It When you download it from online, it comes just exactly like that. Okay. And it has the, um, it has the instructions. And it will play the music. I'm just haven't quite <laughs> gotten it to function correctly. I had the little Jeopardy song on my phone for a little while, but you know, play yeah, around. Th play yeah, around. a thousand years ago, I I used PowerPoint. And it was really clunky, but yeah, I'll definitely yeah, it's in. a PowerPoint, and like you saw, it's I have it on the screen. Sorry, um, like you saw, it does the deletion itself. You know, you just really go down through there and put your questions and plug them in, you know, where you want them to be. And it's fairly easy to set up. I mean, it's a little time consuming, but once you have it, <laughs> you have it. <laughs> I can't hear you now. If you Did you get cut off? No. Um, I was just going to add, uh, which I think touches on several of the presentations, um, you know, so in my educational psychology class that I teach, um, there's, you know, kind of a debate between uh, do we need to make learning fun or is, you know, um, does that work just because it's fun? Does learning happen or, you know, like what are the merits? Because um, I I often struggle with this, right? Because I'm a kind of a serious person. So I want, um, you know, to teach my content. I want them to know the skills and the knowledge, right? But I also have come to recognize that, you know, it's really um, just because it's fun right. doesn't mean they're going to learn. So, so that's fair enough, but it's on us to make it engaging. And, you know, grab that curiosity, may create a need to know. And, and you know, you started off, Vicki, wondering if the adults would want to play games like this. And it turns out, it doesn't matter how old we are, we do actually enjoy a, a format that's, it, it's simply more involving, right? And it's tapping into more, you know, modalities like Kathy was talking about. There's just so many reasons why if we can bring some of that gamification, you right. know, to our lessons, there's real value in getting students interested enough, keeping their attention and making it relevant like Mary Elizabeth, you know, like, kind of just allows us to do all these different elements and tap into that psychology to get them engaged throughout. 
I agree. Thank you, you all. I know we're out of time, so uh, we'll wrap.